comic writer in whose work the reader can encounter Stalin and Auschwitz, a moralist best known for his stylistic extravagance, a writer settled in New York who's marinated in Englishness. My guest this evening is the writer Martin Amis, who turned 65 this week. He published his first novel in 1973, but I suppose came to international prominence in the 1980s with books such as Money and London Fields, novels compelled and appalled by excess. His new novel, The Zone of Interest, his 14th, is set during the Second World War in and around a concentration camp that has more than echoes of Auschwitz. One of the three narrators is Paul Dole, the camp commandant, another Golo Thompson, a Nazi who believes that they will and should lose. And the third, Schmull, a Jewish prisoner whose life depends on collaborating with his captors and who has to loot the bodies of the dead, amongst many other things. The novel, set just as the Nazis begin to be defeated in Russia, weaves together the public story of what happened in the camps with the story of Thompson's desire for Dole's wife. For some, the rapid shifts in tone, the troubling mix of sexual farce and historical tragedy are too much. For others, they are the novel's glory. Martin, I want to come back to that, if I may, but I want to start. You're 65, you and I are the same age. We're born after the Second World War, but you belong to a generation, Howard Brenton, David Hare, amongst others, who keep going back to that period. What compels you to return? Well, I was born four years after the death of Hitler and four years before the death of Stalin. Uh, And these figures loom over me, these titanic figures. I think the interest in uh, Nazi Germany might have sprung from something as trivial as this. When I was about seven or eight, I said to my mother... I'd seen some, some, some photographs of the smokestacks and the rail tracks and, uh, and been disturbed by them. And I said to my mother, Mom, what's all this about uh, Hitler? She said, oh, don't worry about Hitler. He said, you've got blonde hair and blue eyes. Hitler would have loved you. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt a certain ignoble relief that... Um, but then I... Throughout my adult life, I've been thinking, my mother said to me, Hitler would have loved you. And, you know, it may may just be that, as well as... as It's it's also true that the generation of the 1960s, you know, one thinks of Sergeant Pepper, where the Beatles are dressed in military wear. We're kind of haunted by not having been there, Mm. but somehow remembering it. Yes, haunted by that, and by... um, I think it would have been a very straightforward thing to have been conscripted or enlisted, I think I would have been very ready for that fight. In Sword of Honor, Guy Crouchback said... This is Evelyn Waugh's great trilogy. Evelyn Waugh's trilogy says that uh, here was the enemy in, in all its ugliness and vastness, and it was very clarifying for him because you knew here was something you had to fight. But that didn't happen to us. In, instead, we got the sexual revolution... And I say instead because uh, 21 years after the First World War, the Second World War began. And then 21 years after the Second World War, 1966, there was a great realization among all the people, certainly of Europe, that uh, America was already mired in the Vietnam War at that point. But it was realized throughout Europe that... um, this generation of young people breaking the pattern of two previous generations was not going to go out and and be slaughtered on the battlefields of Europe. And this meant that the young could be loved by their elders and by their parents with a a, uh, lack of restraint and lack of inhibition that had been denied to them because everyone knew that fascism meant war and a resumption of the First World War. And then that was, gave the impetus for what became the sexual revolution. I want to come back to that, but I want to start with the title, Zone of Interest, because 
I think this is the most extraordinary novel I've ever read about euphemism. Zone of interest, for those who don't know it, is a description of the area around Auschwitz. And wherever you look in this book, whether it's sexually or in terms of what the Nazis are doing, euphemistic language is used. Indeed, and uh, the zone of interest does in fact confess to something that was kept very quiet, that uh, interest is there in its business sense, the zone of financial interest. And when you read and read about this period, it becomes uh, disgustingly clear that the Holocaust was meant to be a a self-funding operation, that not only were all Jewish businesses were first boycotted then Aryanized, and uh, the, the, the Jews pauperized in that process. But even in the camps, there's, uh, for instance, they, they used up every atom of the dead Jews, their hair, their teeth, their flesh, for monetary gain. And uh, this is a horrible sort of um, modern fact that... Uh, that many of the inmates of Auschwitz actually paid their own way there. And the going rate was the standard third-class fare. The ticket they bought was, um, was one way. And uh, children under 12 travel free. So you see that the perfection of the uh, baseness of the whole project. I wonder if you'd read us something which is from Paul Doll, who is the camp commandant. And he's welcoming a transport of Jews from France, occupied France. It's important to understand that, that the vast majority of Jews who went to Auschwitz were never tattooed or starved or uh, processed in the way we've come to um, imagine they were. They were killed on arrival. Now, this is just a paragraph, and it's Dole's introductory address. He's speaking through a, a bullhorn at these people from Paris, which include, you need to know, um, a little boy in a sailor suit with extravagant bell-bottoms and an elderly, distinguished elderly gentleman in an astrakhan coat. Greeting, I reached for the loud hailer and said, Greetings, one and all. Now, I'm not going to lead you up the garden path You're here to recuperate, and then it's off to the farms with you, where there'll be honest work for honest board. We won't be asking too much of that little young'un, you there in the sailor suit, or of you, sir, in your fine astrakhan coat, each to his or her talents and abilities. Fair enough? Very well. First, we shall escort you to the sauna for a warm shower before you settle in your rooms. It's just a short drive through the birch wood. Leave your suitcases here, please. You can pick them up at the guest house. Tea and cheese sandwiches will be served immediately, and later there'll be a piping hot stew. I want to talk about this Paul Dole passage because it is entirely euphemistic. And the sexual descriptions, of which there are a number, are also euphemistically, comically. So it's very odd because language matters to you like it matters to novelists more than anything else. And here you are constructing a world that will never speak honestly. More than that, uh, the Thompson narrator is straight. And uh, although there's some mysterious things about him that are cleared up, he writes in good, clear, crisp prose. The Schmuel sections, which are shorter than the others... The Jewish guy. The Jewish guy are slightly more sepulchral. But the Dole, uh, the commandant, his narrative is full of unintentional humor um, and self-contradictions. I based it very much on a a book written by the commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, and he wrote it in his death cell in Poland before he was hanged in 1946. And when I read it, I thought, this is almost a great novel by someone like Nabokov, you know, it's uh, of a narrator who is unreliable uh, mendacious and utterly unself aware. So there's that, and also, which was in fact not unenjoyable to create, 
he writes in a kind of horror prose, um, not, not the things he describes so much as his grammar and his uh, diction. He says whilst instead of while. He uses elegant variation and gentilisms throughout. And it's meant to be uh, sort of disgusting to, re- to read for literary reasons. It is, but because as I read Dole, one of the things I thought is, you've always had a fascination with monsters. John Self in Money, or Fred West in Experience, who murdered and did terrible things to your cousin. You're drawn to these dark, gothic figures, if I might put it that way. Oh, yes, and, um, and many other uh, male monsters. Well, they were sort of very bad guys, but... Um, yeah, but you take, inevitably as a writer, you take pleasure in imagining these very bad guys. Yeah, you know, bad Coleridge, guys. Coleridge was once after if he believed in the devil, and he said, yes, he says, because it stops the mind from becoming too narrow. Yeah. Anthony Burgess said to me, I said, do you believe in evil? And he said, he said oh, yes, he said... Um, there's no AJP Taylorish explanation for what happened in Nazi Germany. But while I've, I've created several male monsters, they're not actually evil, although Lionel Asbo certainly does contemplate doing something extremely evil. And this was enlightening when I was exploring Dole as a character. I found I would sit, I would sit there and think, now, he must be able to do something more evil than that, even more evil than that. And I would think, and I'd think, hmm. And it, it's as if you're exploring your own mind for possibility, potentialities of evil. If you'd been a different person, ingenuity in evil, you know, resourcefulness in evil. What draws you to it? Um, impossible to say. Difficult to say. Impossible. Uh, <laughs> You don't know where it comes from. The writing of fiction is, strikes me every year as even more mysterious than I thought it was. You can't quite disentangle all the things that are contributing to it. But I always knew I would, um, that of all the, the classes, uh, class was very present when I began my writing life, that uh, the middle classes would be neglected by me. Um, they're, they're well looked after by a host of writers, but they held no interest for me. The middling sort of folk did not awaken me as a writer. I like extremes, and um, so it isn't that surprising that I've written by now t- second novel about the Holocaust, and also I wrote a novel about the Gulag. So these are presences that hover over my life. One of the biggest euphemisms is that Hitler doesn't get mentioned. He gets referred to but not mentioned by name. You felt the need, which is unusual in you, to write an afterward that lays out how scrupulous you've been in your historical reading, but also it tries to address that there is no why, either to Hitler or to the Holocaust? No, but it's... uh, I hadn't seen it pointed out that um, a remarkable thing, and in itself very remarkable, there's not a single historian who confesses to being baffled by Stalin, and there's not a single historian who who claims to understand Hitler. Um, And this uh, asymmetry in comprehensibility is really remarkable in itself, referred to the sort of sexual undercurrent that you can feel pulsing your way through some of the events of the Holocaust. But I'm convinced that, um, I mean, there are obviously reasons why we don't understand Hitler in that um, there was no ideology. All there was was uh, Nazism was just a rallying cry for, for sadists to attract people who would, who would, would you know, beat and torture and steal and murder without any provocation. He, he, those are the people he wanted in the party. Is that really true? Nazism did have an ideology. It, it, doesn't, it, amount, it? doesn't amount to anything. Well, Le- that may be a different matter, but it did have an ideology. Well, that it had the racial ideology, but um, which was all rubbish right from the start. 
whereas uh, Stalin was obedient to um, you know, a pedantic ideology, Marxism. Um, but I think one of the reasons why we don't understand Hitler is that he is sexually obscure. He is a, a black hole sexually, whereas Stalin was seigneurial and hyperactive in his youth. Um, but, but Hitler, the three schools of uh, thought in Hitler's studies about his sexuality, the school of um, normality, that he was normal sexually, uh, the school of asexuality, uh, and the school of perversion. Um, people ask me which school I belong to, and I say uh, asexuality with a bit of perversion. <laughs> but not the perversion that's... The school of perversion uh, is, consists of the most disgusting, uh, you know, coprophilia and undinism and uh, er, the filthiest things you can possibly imagine. I don't think that. I think, I th I, hang on, yeah. I think he... he he had little bourgeois excitements that um, maybe he would achieve some sort of orgasm if Eva Brown stood at a safe distance and raised her skirt. You know, it would be that kind of excitation. This is the novelist, I ought to say, speculating rather than the historian well, it, describing. Well, when, when a character steps into a novel, you know everything about them sexually because that's the key key to character. This and I could tell you, you the okay, sexuality... This is when or, you begin to sound like a 60s guy, which is sexuality is the key to everything. If you take, you mentioned Stalin, let's take Mao Zedong, who by some conservative estimates you know, killed 35, 40 million, there are accounts much, 70 much million. Child, 90 million. Well, you know, from what one can see, you know, he had a healthy heterosexual appetite. I don't quite see what that Relates to no, I'm, I'm talking about why we don't understand him. But and, is and it no the sexuality? Know, That's what I'm asking. I, well, I'm, I'm saying that um, this is, from the novelist's point of view, this is the key to character. And um, I think it is the fact that he is a void is, uh, is very striking and, and contributes to his unknowability. I want, you know, we've talked about this as a historical novel and in, in certain Ways it is, but I want to talk about it in relationship to you because there's a wonderful quote by Leon Kossoff, the artist, who said of late Walter Sickert, he became rawer and rawer, R A W E R. And I think that probably describes you. You're getting more careless about the way you write. I look at reread Dead Babies, that unprovocative titled early novel of yours. You know, and in a way, there's a lot more control. It's a lot less risky. It's as if, as you're growing older, you, actually, you're getting more careless. Is that I, how I, it I, feels? I, no, absolute opposite of that. Um, that uh, my early work strikes me as careless. Um, no, no, care less, which is different. You don't care anymore about how you're perceived. Otherwise, oh, I see. Yes, um, but not the usual meaning. No, of no, no. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Listen, you're a writer. I would have thought you would have understood the difference between careless and careless. Look, Keep going. Could you put it another way? Because I, <laughs> I, I find it hard to separate the two. Yeah, well, I, th I think that's just a function of age and that you, you begin to be more panoptic as you get older. You want to look back on your whole life and what you've lived through and w the significance of your time. It's a sort of t stock taking feeling and, uh, you know, what happened socially while I was alive what happened politically, geopolitically. So you are not more at home with these big questions than you John used to. Self in Money says, I'm addicted to the 20th century. Are you addicted to the 20th century? Well, uh, I'd be in bad shape by now if I was, because it's the 21st century. But, um, but you're pulled back, it seems to me. The Asbo yeah. book, but you're pulled back to that earlier moment. Yes, that's, uh, that's true. But, well, perhaps, you know, September the 11th, was the, the only really geopolitical, and, and the fall of the Soviet Union, these are the, the only really great geohistorical moments of my lifetime. And I've written a book about the, both subjects, as, as, well as, as well as this mystery of Hitler that just won't go away. And that's, I will continue to read all I can about him, but I don't expect him to yield. This is the singularity of Hitler. 
There's a wonderful moment near the end of Love's Labour's Lost when I think it's Rosalind says to Barome, you think you're funny. Go and try and make the dying laugh for a year. Are there places comedy just shouldn't go? Well, I, would, I, would, I don't believe in no-entry signs. I respect people who say you shouldn't write fiction about the Holocaust, Cynthia Ozick, George Steiner, but it's, it's something uh, self-righteous in its core. It's as if you're saying, well, I happen to care about this more than anyone else. But at what point does a subject become unvisitable? What if something worse than the Holocaust happened? Although the Holocaust is certainly our terminal point so far for, for human infamy and evil, would you not be able to address that if it's on the other side of the barrier marked with the Holocaust? It seems to me an, an artificial and sanctimonious distinction. Martin Amis, thank you very much. Thank you. This is a download from the BBC. For more information and our terms of use, go to bbc.co.uk slash radio 3.